right, so this is using BGP for QoS. I think some people were confused. It's not uh, quality of service for your BGP. It's actually using BGP to build your quality of service policy. It's kind of a, a weird, different thing. A lot of people go for the established presentations of really interesting things. I try and come up with something new and different. Uh, Thomas really inspired me with his New Orleans presentation. I think he did one on um, using DSCP for routing, and that was just crazy, kind of blew my mind, so I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, so getting started, you have to do the about me part. Um, I have some certifications. I actually put A plus on there. Does anybody even care about A plus anymore, right? It makes me feel important uh, and special. Um, but then uh, I grew up cutting my teeth doing Cisco stuff and then uh, got to the Microtech stuff as quick as I could. Um, I've got some certifications there. The one I'm most proud of is the, the trainer certification. That means I survived a class with Giannis all the way through. Um, my day job is director of technology for a data center group called Fibertown. We have a few data centers in Texas and um, I get to do the engineering mostly centered around high availability. You know, we offer ridiculous SLAs to people and so we have to guarantee that it's gonna be up. Um, and I named my ulcers after the data centers that we have because uh, it's just, you know, it's a crazy environment. So I know in the WISP environment, you guys aren't generally wireline all the time. So um, hopefully this is a different kind of perspective for you guys. Um, but there I get to do a lot of different things and to uh, deal with generators and UPSs and chill water systems and monitoring of all those things and branch circuit monitoring of power. So it's, it's just, you never really know what you're gonna run into. Kind of like you guys, you never really know what you're gonna run into. Um, and also do a little bit of consulting. Uh, a lot of times it's turned off, but I'm saving up for a trip to Australia. A good buddy of mine's getting married over there, Andrew Cross. And so uh, I got a ticket to Australia, two, 2,000 bucks a piece. So it's, uh, it's a spike in uh, you know, save up a lot. So I'm definitely picking up. So something else I'm proud of is the Brothers Wisp. It's uh, a bunch of guys that I met through coming to the mom and stuff like that. Um, so you've got myself, you've got Andrew Cox out of Australia, you've got Justin Wilson out of Indiana, I think. You got JJ out of North Carolina. You got Miller, uh, who finally made the slides down here with his cute son Thomas out of Slovakia. Tom uh, Smith, as I'm sure you guys are all well aware of, uh, is the only one on here I didn't have to Photoshop. That's his original picture, that's his real picture. Uh, and then uh, you've got uh, Andrew Thrift with his beautiful hair out in New Zealand. And then uh, you've got Mike Hammett, who wasn't able to make it, but uh, he's a hoot. You guys know get a hold of Mike. We'll talk to him, and he will talk with me almost as much as JJ. But, um, but yeah, yeah, talking about these guys. So we get together, podcast. We're always on Skype chatting back and forth. And so it's really kind of this brain trust. It's really cool. Um, so definitely hit us up, see what we're all about, ask us questions, get involved. It's uh, a lot of fun. There's no promotional incentive for us. It's just fun. Uh, plus, it's a lot of guys to ask questions to that work in a lot of different areas, so it's, it's awesome for that. So, on to the presentation, some assumptions, because there's only 30 minutes, so I'm going to assume that you are somewhat familiar with BGP and its operations, so ASN, autonomous system numbers, setting up peers, filters, at least to a certain degree, uh, as well as quality of service. And um, you saw a pretty good uh, presentation from Babiola earlier that had some quality of service kind of introductory stuff in there, so that would be a good one to review. Um, but we're gonna be using address lists, mangle rules, few trees. We're still gonna review some of that as we go, though. And I also tend to talk fast, so just kind of raise your hand if I'm getting to go uh, a little bit too quick. So what is BGP, Border Gateway Protocol? It's a dynamic routing, pro routing protocol that runs the internet, it exchanges NLRI, which Tom actually talked about uh, earlier. Um, and so it's not just routes, it's also attributes attached to that. We're gonna use some of those. Um, and whenever I'm gonna talk about really what we're getting, I'm just gonna say routes. You can just assume it's an LRI. Uh, but there you can, from your ISP, you can get all the internet routes, the full route table. You can get partial routes. You can get default or a combination thereof. What we're actually gonna do is use filter rules. So we're gonna take the full route table, but we're gonna filter out uh, slash 24 and smaller, so slash 24, slash 25. That actually takes your route tables. So in the States, off of most of my peers, we're at about 550,000 routes. And if you filter out slash 24 and smaller, that cuts you down to about 250,000 routes. So uh, you'll converge quicker. It's uh, fewer resources on your, your RAM, right? And when, if you have other IBGB peers and you're sharing those routes, 
all that stuff goes quicker, it's less intensive. So whenever you're pulling routes, your CPU is going to skyrocket. And so if you can cut that time in half, your CPU is only going to be skyrocketing half the time. So it's just a little bit more efficient. But here in the slide, towards the bottom, Miller let me borrow his sweet purple pen here. Um, you can see I've got IFT peer with about 240,000 routes. That's after we filter out the, the other stuff. And then I'm doing an open exchange inter, or, uh, interface here, a connection. So this is really just a, a lab open exchange. It's not a real one. Um, and I'm not sure how familiar you guys with open exchange, um, but you really should be, uh, especially in the WISP industry. <coughs> so an open IX is you go into a facility, generally a data center, and they'll have a shared infrastructure, and a whole lot of people will connect to that, and you can peer with them. So normally, if I'm peering with you over here or you over here, I don't have to pay you one-to-one. -one. Whoever uh, is handing you that cable, though, you're obviously going to have to pay them. They're going to get their pound of flesh one way or the other. But um, it's, uh, they also generally have route servers on there. So if you have 100 peers, there'll be two route servers that sit in the middle, and you'll just peer with them. So instead of having 100 individual BGP sessions, you just have the two. And you generally only share your personal routes. So it works a lot more efficiently that way. Um, and on those exchanges, oftentimes you can find content providers like Netflix and Hulu. And you can also find CDNs, content delivery networks like um, Cloudflare or Akamai or Limelight, all that good stuff. So normal WISP traffic, you'll see if you can get to a, a really heavily utilized open exchange, you can see 70% of your traffic go that direction. And it's generally a fixed cost. So you can get a 10 gig port into an open exchange for a fixed fraction of what you would normally pay for DIA. So it's not only are you not using your internet traffic, you know, for Netflix and stuff like that, but you're also a lot closer. So there's no throttling, there's no restrictions, it's a better experience for the user. So it's, and you're saving money. It's good all the way around. You just have to get to one of those open exchanges. And so you'll see an example of that in this configuration later. So starting out, our first steps are going to be create some route filters, apply them, and verify them. So route filters, so we have our ISP connection here at the top. They're sending us routes. And so a route filter, uh, and I think Tom covered it pretty thoroughly, but I'm just going to give you the quick and dirty on it. Um, you've got an incoming filter. So normally you're going to block RFC 1918. You know, uh, you're going to block your own routes coming in, so nobody's going to spoof anything. Um, you're going to allow special routes through, and we're going to do some manipulation of those. And then after that, you're just going to allow everything else through. And then outbound, normally you're just going to allow only your address space to go out. Since this is a lab environment, and I didn't want to actually break anything, I filtered everything going out, so I'm not actually sending any routes out. So route filters, routing filter, you can add those guys in there. There's a lot of different attributes you can match, so you can look at different BGP things. You can look at uh, prefix, prefix link, uh, all the way down to OSPF type. So route filters aren't just for BGP, they're for any dynamic routing protocol. Uh, you can take simple actions on the, the routes coming in, like accept or reject, just drop them, or you can do more complex actions, like change the next hop when they hit the route table, set BGP prending, prepending or community strings, things like that. Uh, let's see, so our route filter example here, I'm going to be matching for twitch.tv. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or not, so it's basically a, a gaming streaming site where you can play games and stream it live. People actually make their living doing that, believe it or not, it's pretty crazy. Uh, Voodoo, like the, um, the Walmart video streaming service. Uh, and then down here is some of our OpenIX. And so it's gonna be three AS path matching. So autonomous system paths. Um, BGP is what you call path vector. So normally, like with OSPF, uh, we look at router to router. So my router wants to know what's their next router to go to, right? That's your internal routing protocols. Whereas BGP doesn't care about routers, it cares about autonomous systems, big conglomerations of routers. So your AS number that's assigned to you by Aaron here in the States uh, can represent one router, it can represent 100 routers. And when I'm looking at my BGP table, all I see is your AS number, right? So we're looking giant system to giant system. And so in our matching, we're gonna be looking for origin autonomous system, so where it is originated from, where is that traffic sourced from. So here's a quick example of our Twitch TV. 
We just named it BGP QoSN. Here's our autonomous system matching. So it's, um, you can see that caret symbol means the beginning of the path. I've got a period asterisk for a regex match, comma, and then 46489, which is their autonomous system number, and then it ends with a dollar sign that means the end. And so autonomous system numbers are actually built right to left. So the origin starts here. The next AS it pops through will be on the left, and then it keeps adding it to the left as it goes through. So this is how we can tell where it's sourced from. Action is going to be pass through, so you could say accept and it'll stop there. If you say pass through, it'll continue on down, looking at other route filters to see if it needs to do other manipulation. And then our action here is we're actually setting the route comment to RC streaming video. So it doesn't, it doesn't inherently affect the route at all. It's just setting a route comment. So when it pops in the route table, it'll actually have this little comment associated with it. Then we're going to apply the filter. So on our BGP tier, which is going to be routing, BGP, the peers tab, um, it's our ISP peers, so we're setting our inbound filter because we want to manipulate the routes as they're coming in. So something of note, whenever you first set the in filter, so say you've got a BGP peer up, you're removing traffic, it's the peak time. If you set this filter, it actually resets your peer. So it disconnects you from them and then reconnects and then rebuilds. So it's going to be service impacting, so you want to do it in an off time. Also, whenever you adjust any of the filter entries, so say later on, you decide there's another AS you want to adjust, you go in there and add an entry, it actually invalidates all of the routes in the route table momentarily and then runs them all through the filter and then brings them back online. So that can be service impacting as well. So just keep that in mind. So route verification. So we applied it to the peer. It's run through. We just did a simple print detail where. And you can see that it's added our RC streaming video for uh, the Twitch address space, and we'll actually see it in action in a video in just a second. I don't do that crazy live stuff anymore. I do it all video based. Um, and so then here's the uh, filter rule for our open peer. It looks very similar, same chain, same action pass through, only we're setting the uh, route comment to RCOIX, so route comment, open exchange. And in this one, we're actually uh, matching on the BGP community, right? So community is just kind of an arbitrary string. It's transitive, which means it'll pass through, but it's not mandatory. So nobody actually has to allow this uh, community through. But it's just a, it's just a text string. That's all it really does. It doesn't affect your routes at all. Um, it just allows you in filters to manipulate traffic later on. Or um, you can check community strings in the route print, and you can kind of see some different information. So if you want to tag it for some reason or another, you can just use it informationally. And we're also, this is not really germane to this, but it's interesting, we're setting the local preference to 110. So in BGP, when it's picking route, if your local preference is above the default 100, say 110, it's going to prefer this route over everything else, even uh, if the AS path is much longer. So anything coming from our open exchange, you want to prefer that. So everybody will use that, because it's normally a whole lot cheaper and a whole lot more efficient for us to use the open exchange. So we want to force everything in that direction. So route verification for OpenIX, you can see it actually attached once it made through the filter. And you can see down here the BGP community string. So print detail actually gives you a whole lot of great information. It'll also tell you uh, BGP AS path, so every hop in the way to give you all the origin. It'll tell you everything about the peer in there. In our example, I just made up 4.4.4 uh, slash 24 coming from our OpenIX. So our next steps is now that we have the routes in the route table and they have these route comments, what good is that going to do us, right? So I actually wrote a script uh, that does all the kung fu. This is where the magic happens. And uh, we're going to show how you create it, explain it, verify, and schedule it. So here's the script. I'm not going to bother showing it because uh, it's actually up on my blog. You can just download and grab it. And it doesn't make sense to a lot of people anyway. Um, but in effect, what it does is it loops through the route table. So it'll start at the top and it'll work its way down. And it'll look for any routes that have a route comment to start with RC, as we matched in our filter rules. If it finds one, first thing it does is checks, uh, is there an address list entry that's already identical to this? If it is, it deletes it. And then it moves down and it adds it in. So whatever the route comment is, it adds an address list entry with that route comment as the name. And then whatever the destination for that route was, it adds that in the address list. So now we have a route entry, and I'll show it to you in a minute. It's, so it just crawls through, finds all the address lists, 
uh, all rather all the route comments add address list so we end up just building some big list uh, that we can play with a little bit later uh, it also adds it for 24 and a half hours um, the idea is we schedule the run every 24 hours so if something is uh, old and stale and isn't advertised anymore it just times out and falls out of the address list um, let's see so whenever you're running the script it is a bit CPU intensive so I tried it first on a dual 3.5 Xeon took about 75 seconds to run and the procs went to about 80% utilization um, on a, then I switched to a quad core 3 took about 45 seconds to run and CPU went to about 40% um, I think Tom has good advice for what to do if you don't have enough horsepower. Yeah, I hear the chuckle. You guys know what I'm talking about. So here's a quick uh, example of running the script. Let's see if the video plays. It does indeed. So you can see it's uh, four cores, three gigahertz. I've actually got the CPU statistics here. As you can see, here's a route with a route comment associated with it. And this one I just tagged as Netflix so you could see it in here. And then at some point, you can see the route table is 240,000 routes. The script, I'm waiting for the timer to hit an even interval there. And then it should run. There you go, you can see the CPU cranking on this guy. It's gonna go through and then it's gonna start dynamically building those address lists as it pops through and finds them. So if you watch it, it takes, give or take about 35 seconds. And again, after that, I'll run it again just so you can see it go through and delete entries and re-add, but that's boring, you don't wanna watch that anyway. So after that, we do a uh, script schedule. So that script, we need it to run uh, every 24 hours. The idea though is if the CPU is gonna spike, you wanna do it in an off time. So I pick 4 a.m. when we have really low utilization on our traffic. So it'll hit uh, pretty evenly. It's actually running pretty well, even though it's a proof of concept, I've actually put it in practice and it's, it's working. So uh, we're just gonna take a look at what the address list entries look like as they pop through. You saw them earlier, so uh, RC, route comment, OIX, open exchange, then we have our streaming video. Again, 24 and a half hour timeout. Um, so what can you do with this? Once you have an address list, the rest of it's easy. You can use them in filter rules, say for your firewall. I can't imagine what you would do with that. Um, NAT rules, mangle rules. So specifically, we're gonna use them in mangle rules to mark packets as they're moving through it. So we're gonna create a couple of mangles. So in this example, um, kind of a use case for this is say you have an internet customer and you say, I'm gonna give you 10 megabits of everything that goes to the internet and I'm gonna charge you X price for that. But anything that happens to go to my open exchange since it's a fixed price and I'm not really paying for it per se, I'm gonna let you have that unlimited for free. I'm not gonna charge you for that. So what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, send all normal internet traffic out this direction through an overall constricting 10 meg rate limit and then all the open exchange is just gonna bypass the side unrestricted. I'm not necessarily saying you should do that. It's just an interesting case use for it. Um, so up here at the top, we're gonna do an open IX connection mark, right? So as the connection initially establishes, gonna put a connection mark, it's gonna move through and then it'll mark the packets incoming out zone so we know which direction because we're gonna be doing Q trees for HDD. And same thing or similar thing with streaming video down here. So we'll mark it uh, via our BGP mark at the top and then we have packet marks as well. And so you can see for streaming video, I actually have some layer seven matching in there. Um, layer seven is really CPU intensive, right? Because it's having to open those packets and actually crunch against a regex. So if you can match based on an address list first, super efficient, runs really fast, and it bypasses this layer seven. So anything you can match above, you don't even need to use the layer seven. It'll pass right through and hit those packet marks. So it's really super efficient on your firewall. Um, marking open exchange. And again, this is really quick because I'm assuming you guys know a little bit about this. Plus every uh, every other presentation I've seen has a little bit of this in there. So. Uh, Pre-routing, destination address, address uh, RCOIX. So again, we're just referencing all those address lists we built. Mark connection, open IX, and then packet marks. So this is for the incoming. So you just look for incoming interface, connection mark, action mark packet, and OIX in, and the transverse OIX out. Moving on, doing basically the exact same thing with the Twitch TV traffic. 
only we're marking it as streaming video in and streaming video out instead of OIS. So now we're going to create a few queue trees. And so I have uh, kind of a, a sample QoS script on my blog you can grab and use if you want. It's got just a lot of different things, so gaming, VPN, normal download, um, some streaming video stuff in there. So you have the overall constricting rate limit there, the 10, and then we have our bypass ones right here for OpenIX. It's pretty straightforward. Here's just kind of building those queues. So for the OIX, we just say global with a packet mark in, global packet mark out. So it just separates them and puts no rate limit on them. Let's do a little verification. Again with the videos, because I'm too timid to try this stuff live. There we go. So I'm using Torch, an amazing tool that Tom talked about, poor man's NetFlow. Uh, as you can see, I was doing ICMP to the open exchange just to create some traffic. So as you see, I haven't run the script yet, so everything's uh, blank, so nothing's getting matched in the queue trees or in the mangle rules. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to fire off the script. As you can see right now, uh, that traffic has a connection mark of admin because it's just standard ICMP. And then this script's going to crank, it's going to crank for a few seconds. And then you can see the connection mark switched to OIX, the address list built, the connection mark is now hitting properly. So you can see the OIX traffic. You can switch back and you can see the packet count is actually moving up in the mangle. So everything's getting properly matched. And then when you head over to the Q tree, you'll actually see all that traffic bypassing. It's nothing earth shattering, right? So all that traffic is now bypassing right there. And then we can switch over to the Twitch TV just to get an example of some of the streaming videos. You can see there's no address list entries. And we'll run that guy, connection mark. So you can see there's no connection mark for any of this traffic. And this is going to be actual live traffic going to Twitch TV for streaming video. You can see the CPU cranking again. So it averages about 40%, 35%. It kind of jumps around. That was us using our destination address list right there for the streaming video. Again, using address lists so much more efficient than anything else, or anything else as in layer seven. And then it's just gonna switch back in a second and show you the verification of the streaming video packet marks being hit. It takes it a second though, because their 199 addressings right at the bottom of the uh, the route table, so it has to crank through for a little bit before it actually hits. In just a second, you'll see it pop up and say streaming video on the connection mark. I wonder what it would do on a CCR. I haven't run it on one of those yet. I've noticed that if you saw here earlier, yeah, so you saw the connection uh, tracking actually pick up the streaming, and you'll see the counters start to go up. So it multi-threads. When the script's running, you actually see it cut across three of the processors. Um, so if you went with a, a 36 core router, I'm assuming it's going to be multi-thread across all of those. Your CPU should be more efficient. I would really like to see kind of what it does. Um, but that's it in a nutshell. So we used BGP incoming filters to mark our routes and then build address lists based on that. And once you have them there, you can do anything. So you're matching autonomous system numbers. Um, you can pick out your favorite services, mark the source traffic and go from there without having to resort to layer seven and things like that in the future. Uh, one last thing, just come and say hi to me. Uh, it's one of the main reasons we come to this thing is to, to meet people, say hi, say hello. Uh, everybody else drinks beer, especially Tom. I'm sure he would be happy for you to buy him one. And uh, you guys have fun. Any of the slides are just the resources, links to everything. Uh, and everything should be available. So that's it. You guys have any questions? Guy in the corner. Do where um, a comment exists, right, 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 and it would just cut out like you know five hundred thousand things you have Index to it iterate bit. through. And Actually, I tried that, very and, it, and it didn't make it that much more efficient, so I just left it. Oh, okay, because I was being lazy. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> and also, the I tried it where it would just time out, say at twenty three and a half hours, and then you'd run it at twenty four, so all those entries would time out instead of doing the the find and remove. 
command, but adding the, the find and remove actually only added about two or three seconds to the script, so it seemed worth it. That way there's no overlap, so there's no gap where the address lists are ever gone, you know, and your quality of service just isn't matching. It's always seamless. As long as they're still advertising every 24 hours when the script runs, it'll continuously match all that traffic and move all the way through. Oh, okay. There's a, there's a blog entry. If you just go to gregsoul.com, it's right at the top. And it's got all the scripts, all the stuff. You can see all that effort I've taken into manipulating. Hopefully if you make it better, you post it in the comments. Miller, suggestion there, uh, how peanut gallery. Um, how does net neutrality play in all this? I think you're not, I think you can use this for good or for evil, it's up to you. Um, I think really what it is, um, is you're, you're not necessarily restricting some people, you're just giving priority to others. I know that's kind of a, <laughs> it's kind of a wrong way to say it. But normally you can do these things at the customer's request. So if it's a customer router and they say, we want you to elevate these things, Net neutrality doesn't factor in because it's not you, a service provider, restricting somebody's access. It's them asking you to make these manipulations to improve their service. So if you've got a big MVU and they say, hey, uh, people are dying at Netflix. You know, they're not able to get to it at peak time. Can you, can you help us? Can you make an adjustment? And you say, absolutely. You, as the end customer, I can adjust your traffic for you. We can use this really efficiently. So you saw me using the full internet route table. Who's to say you actually have to do that? What you can do is peer with your backbone and instead of uh, filtering out specific or sending the whole routes, you can say just send traffic sourced from Netflix via BGP or via Twitch or via whoever and then in this quality of service, it's only gonna crunch 15 routes, right? So the script's gonna run instantaneously instead of having to do the layer seven matching and all of that. So you can actually push it down right to this guy. And then you could even, um, in the BGP options as action, you could do a route mark as well, not just a connection, or not just a route comment, but you can route mark and it'll send it to a completely different route table that's unused. So it's really just there for your quality of service policies. Hopefully that was a very political roundabout way <laughs> of saying that you could, I guess you could squeeze it at the top, but you could ethically use it when a customer asks you to. Any other questions? I guess we're good. Cool. Thanks, guys.